Hello and welcome to the second in our series of presentations under the theme, The Hour of His Judgment. We're calling our presentation for today, A Call to Arms, A Call to Arms. The scripture lesson is one that I have certainly used before and perhaps you will hear at other times during this summit because it is so apropos to the times in which we find ourselves. Turn with me, if you will, to the book of Romans, the book of Romans, chapter 13, and we'll give you just a moment to find it. When you get to Romans 13, we want to zero in on verses 11 through 13. Romans 13, 11 through 13 will serve as our foundation text for our message today. Before we read from the Word of God, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, again we praise you and thank you for the privilege that is ours, not only to attend this virtual summit, but to hear words of impress and import that are so very much calculated to prick our minds and consciences as we get closer and closer to the time when Christ shall come to take us home. We ask, Lord, that you would teach us those things that you would have us to know, that you would bless us, Father, with your presence, your power, your Holy Spirit. For we need not only to hear a word from the Lord, but we need the power of the Lord to put into practice those things that will help prepare us for that day when Christ comes again. We know that it is soon. But we want more than anything, Lord, to be ready for that day. Would you be pleased, dear Father, to equip us anew and again on this day so that we can be prepared for that day, which we know is soon to come. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I'm in Romans 13, beginning at verse 11 and reading through to verse 13. The Bible says... And do this, I'm reading from the New King James, knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. And verse 13, let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, lust not in strife and envy. And I'll just go on and read verse 14 since uh, it's the last one in the chapter concludes this thought. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. On February 6, in the year 1890, some 130 years ago, Ellen White delivered a morning worship talk to a group of students. Now, these students had braved the chilly February Battle Creek, Michigan air and on that cold, frigid day, they came to hear words of special import to her and to them. She chose, as directed by God and the Holy Spirit, to interweave themes dealing with war and sin and Satan and the plight of the remnant. In fact, uh, her message dealt very much with the idea of the remnant and how the remnant were called to carry on the age-old fight with Satan. She talked about the never-ceasing conflict that each of us must find ourselves in. Her words were perhaps a little more sober, a little more somber. They expressed a bit more gravitas uh, than perhaps at other times. They gave voice 
I would dare say, to a rising burden in her soul. You see, throughout the 1880s and the 1890s, uh, and even to a greater extent, uh, throughout the rest of her life, through the turn of the century and into the early teens of the 20th century, she became queen, keenly aware of this idea that the hour of his judgment had come, but more than that, special preparation must be made by the people of God to address and redress the times in which we were living. She was aware that the ancient Day of Atonement, the typical, uh, the antitypical atonement services, the 2300-year day prophecy, October 22, 1844, the realigning <coughs> of our preaching and its theological underpinnings, all were very, very important and all were part of present truth. It gave a very special tenor to her speaking and to her addressing the days in which this Adventist church was finding itself. She knew and understood that Christ needed to be the center of all that we do and all that we say and all that we are given what he was and is doing in the sanctuary. She was convinced that we needed to move Christ and the doctrine of Christ, which we call Christology, from the periphery of our preaching to the very heart and center of our preaching and our teaching. She understood that Jesus had to be at the center. It all had to surround Christ. It was all about lifting up Christ. The idea, the understanding that Christ was not on the edge of our theology. He was indeed at the heart of our theology. theology. And I mind you that this Battle Creek worship address was just a year, year and a half after that tectonic 1888 Minneapolis General Conference that we've talked about so many, many times and that uh, Adventists are so familiar with. Adventism was still in the throes, dare I say, of its own internal counter-reformation as the doctrines of grace and righteousness by faith and faith in general had moved along with the doctrine of Christ and his sacrifice had moved or were being moved from the edges of our teaching to the very heart of our teaching. Um, remember, we, we were a people who got our identity, got our name, got our identity from what Christ was doing in the heavenly sanctuary in October of 1844. And this understanding of the centrality of Christ and the importance of Christ and the work of Christ and the sacrifice of Christ was being buried under an avalanche of law keeping and law preaching. And Ellen White struggled along with uh, Jones and Wagner and others in the church who saw that the way we were going was not the way that God would have us to go, that Christ needed to be the foundation and the superstructure of all that we, do, all that we were doing and all that was happening in the church. Yet this idea struggled to gain traction and acceptance in the highest echelons of the Seventh-day Adventist church. In the book, Third Selected Messages, page 183, Ellen White decries where the church was going and where it was headed. She says this, there have been entire discourses, dry and Christless, in which Jesus has been scarcely named. Why, she asks, 
are our lips so silent upon the subject of Christ's righteousness and his love for the world? She saw the direction that the church was heading in. And she tried as best she could, as God gave her strength, to reverse that course, as did Jones, as did Wagner. And of course, this was the burden, the overriding burden of the 1888 Minneapolis General Conference. She continues, we have preached law until our messages are as dry as the hills of Gilboa, which receive neither dew nor rain. Again, third selective messages, page 183. My paraphrase, some preachers were actually afraid of, in fear of, teaching and preaching the message of righteousness by faith. They thought that the preaching of grace would give people license to sin. They thought that the preaching of cheap grace, the idea, the understanding that all we had to do is believe in Christ and accept Christ and surrender to Christ and our sins were forgiven, would encourage men and women in sin. They did not understand the working of the power of the Holy Spirit. And so justification was not preached. Sanctification certainly was not preached. It was law, law, law. Law, And as she said, we have preached law until our messages are as dry as the hills of Geboa, which receive neither dew nor rain. We had skewed our theology over to the right, uh, leaning too much on law and squeezing out the love of Jesus Christ. Ellen White continues, because this work has not been done, Lifting up of Christ in his character, the remnant has, or rather is, unprepared for battle. They have no strength. The churches are ready to die, she says, because so little of Christ is presented. The churches are ready to die because so little of Christ is presented. They, that is the churches, have no spiritual life or discernment. Now, as you're listening to these words from 130 years ago, I want you to ask yourself a question. Look at your church. Look at the Adventists that you know, the Christians that you know. Do you think in the last 130 years, the churches have gotten stronger or weaker? Have we gotten better, even though we've gotten bigger? Have we gotten better? Are we better now than we were 130 years ago? Are we closer to Christ now than we were 130 years ago? We are closer to his coming. But is this Laodicean church in which we now find ourselves, is it closer to Christ or is it further from him? Is it stronger in Christ or is it weaker? Is it more prepared for the coming of the Lord or less prepared? I dare say that for many of us we have, and I will use this term, zombied our way to this hour in which we find ourselves. Interestingly, uh, there was a program for many years on AMC called Fear the Walking Dead. Now, I must uh, admit I've never seen it, never watched one second of it. I don't really have time to waste, and the Lord has given me X number of hours on this earth, and I would never want to waste uh, any of it watching uh, something like that. Uh, but I am told that it was very, very popular. I don't know if it's still on, ran for many years. But I, I do have a very facile mind. And I found the title intriguing, uh, Fear the Walking Dead. The Bible tells me in John 6, 63, that it's, it's the spirit that quickeneth. The faith profiteth, no, profiteth nothing. So we ought to fear the walking dead. 
And a Christless church is a dead church. Christless churches are dead churches. Christless Christians are dead Christians, if we can call them Christians at all. And we ought to fear the walking dead. In fact, we ought to fear becoming part of the walking dead. Uh, we need to make sure that we are not walking dead, but that we are full of the Spirit of God, for it is the Spirit that quickeneth, it is the Spirit that gives life, and we must have the Spirit of God, the love of Jesus, if we are to be ready for the times in which we live, if we are to meet the assaults of Satan, if we are to be given the strength to lift up the name of Jesus, if we are to be the overcomers that God has called us to be, if we are to be the successful examples of Christian living that Christ wants us to be, we must be filled with the Spirit and filled with the love of Christ so that we are not part of the walking dead. How apropos that given the hour of judgment in which we find ourselves, that given the hour of judgment of this world that has come, that not only are we to be aware of the times in which we live, but we ought to be awake and alert and at our post of duty so that Christ can use us to do a mighty work for him. Ladies and gentlemen, the time for play is past. The time for armchair Christianity, and you will hear me say this over and over again, is past. It's time to get off the couch and in the game for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This hour demands that Christians be at their post of duty, that nothing take the place of doing the work of the Lord, that nothing takes the place of being ready to go about our Father's errands and to do his business um, and doing his will. Now, let me get just a sidebar very quickly. Uh, a few short months after this speech, the brethren shipped Ellen White off to Australia. And I say shipped her off to Australia because she wrote in her uh, diary and, and mentioned to her secretary that, um, I feel no call from the Lord to go. Of course, going to Australia, even today, I've been there once, twice, three times. Uh, Irma and I have, have been there and we've ministered in Australia. It's an awful trip to go by plane nowadays. I think, as I recall, it's around 27 hours uh, on the plane. That's an awful long time to be on an airplane. Um, Back then, during the days of Ellen White, I think it was the better part of six months by ship. Uh, an awful trip uh, just beats your body up, and um, you get to Australia, and you are just worn out. And as bad as it is going from the United States to Australia uh, and ministering, the trip back is worse than the trip out. Uh, when we came back from, from Australia, your, your body is just out of sorts for 10 days to two weeks. You, you, you're sleeping in the middle of the day and can't sleep at night, and you're hungry at one time and the wrong time. It's just, you just, it just messes with your, your, your constitution. Uh, it's not a, a, a good trip and not one that you want to do too often. But the saints uh, there are beautiful, and uh, the church is growing, but it, it, it's a, a tough uh, ministry trip. Well, back then, uh, six months on a boat, really, really tough. And so shortly after she went to uh, the Minneapolis General Conference, the brethren shipped her off to Australia. Um, she said, I don't feel a call from God to go, but I'm going because I'm trying to be obedient. While there, interestingly enough, once she got to Australia, uh, she wrote that she suffered worse during the Next couple of months, six weeks or two months, I don't remember exactly, uh, the worst suffering of her life. 
She was crippled, she was paralyzed, she could not move. Sometimes only her hand was able to move so that she could write, but everything else ached, everything else was in pain. She suffered mentally, physically, spiritually, attacked by the devil, uh, the worst suffering of her life. But she did say, she did say in praise to God that that suffering drove her closer to the Lord than at any time in her life, but she did suffer greatly. God used her during that trip to start Avondale College, uh, the publishing work in Australia, the health work in Australia. Uh, an orchard was purchased that was giving no fruit, and uh, God showed her how to do a couple things, add a couple changes, and the orchard began to bloom uh, wonderfully. Just a number of miracles at the hand of God to let her know that even though uh, she was sent there uh, because the brethren were trying to get her out of the way for a while, that God was with her and that wherever she went, the hand of the Lord was upon her. She bought a German shepherd dog that she named Tiglath Pileser, and uh, a number of very nice things happened when she was there because the Lord was with her during that time. B uh, but I digress, because on that freezing morning, that February 1890 freezing morning, she spoke to older saints and to the young people at Battle Creek, and uh, uh, she laid her burden upon them. Among other things, she said this. We shall have to battle with the enemy of our souls until the coming of the Lord. And so she wanted her people to have no illusions as to the battles that they were going to be called to fight. She wanted them to understand clearly that this battle with the enemy is a battle that will continue to the coming of the Lord. No detente, no rapprochement, no vacations, no breaks, no pauses, no downtime, no time out, that we will have to f constantly fight against the enemy until Jesus comes again or until we close our eyes in death. Things will not get any better. The battle is going to get more fierce and uh, it's going to wax hotter and hotter uh, until Christ comes. That's the legacy of being a Christian in God. You see, the, 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 the burden of the Christian, the thing that, that, that you've got to watch out for and understand is that you never get a vacation from fighting the enemy. You fight from the time you give your heart to the Lord until the time you close your eyes in death. No breaks, no stops, no vacations one continual warfare. Praise God, we are assisted in that warfare with and by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and our victory is assured. She continues. This is from that February 1890 message. When Christ was upon the earth, he contended with the enemy for the salvation of men, of man rather, and when he left the world, he committed the conflict to his followers. So Christ carried on the battle while he was here. And when he left, he put the war in our hands. He committed the conflict to his followers to be carried forward in his name. I'm so glad that we are called to fight in the name of Jesus. For in the name of Jesus, there is victory. She continues, we are to wage this war day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute. So there's no break. There's no downtime. This war has to be carried on and even more so as we see, the Bible says, the day approaching. To every soul of us, belongs the battle. Now, if those words were present truth in 1890, some 130 years ago, we are 130 years closer now to the coming of our Lord. They certainly are present truth for you and for me today. They are the watchword for this hour of judgment which has come. 
This is a call to arms. This is, as it were, reveille for the world and certainly for the people of God. This is God's wake-up call for his church and for his people. The truth is, like it or not, believe it or not, accept it or not, ready or not, the judgment is set, Daniel chapter 7. The books are opened, and we will discuss this and examine this a little bit uh, more closely in our next message. And the court is in session. And eternal destinies are being determined even as we speak. God's people must be about God's business because judgment is going on even now. And we are in the throes of a cosmic conflict. You see, the, the conflict, the controversy is between Christ and Satan. And we, his people, are but collateral damage. Satan doesn't care about us. Satan knows that hurting us hurts Jesus. Satan is a liar and a murderer. That's his M.O. When he had Christ in his clutches, he immediately set out to murder him. He did so at his birth. He did so in the years following his birth. He did so throughout his ministry. And finally, after 33 years of service, he succeeded in his end. But death could not hold Jesus. Praise God, Christ defeated Satan when he defeated death and became victor uh, in the cosmic conflict. So then this cosmic conflict now has a personal dimension because we are the saints for whom Christ had, has died. Didn't start out that way. This war did not begin with us. It was ongoing. And when we gave our life to the Lord, we stepped in, we enlisted, as it were. The moment you decided to follow Jesus, the moment you decided to surrender your life to him, that's the same moment Satan decided to put you on his enemies list and to fight against you. And the cosmic conflict became personal because you enlisted in the Lord's army. Satan says no when you say yes to Christ. The idea of what heaven is like, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither has it entered in your heart what's in heaven and the fact that you've decided to go to heaven Satan says, you don't know what heaven is like, but I used to live there. And I want to make sure that you never get a chance to. And so the cosmic conflict now becomes a personal conflict. I am so glad that we serve a personal Savior who can help us in this personal fight with the enemy. There is a cosmic conflict. There is a conflict between dark angels and good angels and Satan as the accuser of the brethren. And so there's this metaphysical cosmic aspect to this. But there is also a very personal aspect to it. Satan wants to hurt you. Satan wants to destroy you. Satan wants to separate you from the Lord. That is why it is so important that we accept Christ as our personal savior to help us in this personal conflict in which we are all involved. I, reminded, I am reminded of those powerful words of the reformist Martin Luther when he wrote that powerful hymn of the church, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Listen to these words. He says, For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great. And armed with cruel hate, 
on earth is not his equal. True and sobering words. The equal of Satan does not exist on this earth. We are no match for the wiles of the enemy. But Christ is. And that's why you need to have Christ in your life if you're going to defeat Satan because only Christ is powerful enough to defeat Satan. You want to read a chilling account. In the book, Early Writings, Ellen White was shown in vision Satan. She says he saw, she saw him sitting with his head in his hand, sort of sitting uh, like this. She describes his frame. She says he's a large-framed individual. She says his skin hung loosely about his, his, uh, his, his frame. She talks about the slyness and the cunningness and the evil that has etched itself in his face. She says he was once a beautiful shining angel and there are still vestiges of that beauty there, but they have been marred by the evil to which he has bent himself for so long. She talks about his, his head. She says the, the, the skull, the, 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 the forehead receded back from the eyes and she talked about his eyes deep and penetrating and very, very scary. She said when she saw him, he was thinking very deeply, head in hand, thinking. She says, as she saw and looked, she saw a smile begin to go across his face. She said it was satanic and, and evil and very frightening. And she says, that's the smile that Satan gets just about the time he is catching a Christian in his snare. That's the kind of smile that he gets when he is closing the trap door on one of God's children when he has wounded Christ by seizing and taking hostage one of his children, one of those for whom Christ had, had died, has died. So uh, she talks about the reality of this warfare um, and understanding the wiles of the enemy. The truth is, uh, one of the mistakes that we can make is underestimating uh, our enemy. The cold reality of these times in which we find ourselves is the undeniable fact that Satan, the dragon, the devil, the, agri the adversary is enraged with the church of God. Uh, you never want to underestimate him. By the same token, you, want, you don't want to give him too much credit because he's a defeated foe. And though he is trying to take as many uh, of God's people with him as he can, the truth is he is a defeated foe. Uh, judgment has not been executed on him, but Christ defeated him at the cross. When Christ was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, that marked the death knell for Satan. And when Christ came forth from the grave, he defeated death, given the promise that all of those who die in Christ will also defeat death. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. But before death is destroyed, Satan will be destroyed, so he is a defeated foe. As powerful as he is, as wily as he is, as strong as he is, we must put above his name the word defeated. Not executed yet, but defeated on death row, as it were, and uh, awaiting his destruction, which one day will come. So this battle, this corporate battle that we're talking about is just as real as any battle in, uh, that has ever been fought and uh, the consequences are as real as any battle that has ever been fought. Ellen White says if the curtain could be pulled back, and we could see and witness the pitched battles between the forces of good and the forces of evil, uh, we would be shocked and amazed and impressed with the reality of the state in which we find ourselves. One of the things 
that um, uh, shocked me and, and uh, really is sobering is this idea that in the last days, when the seven last plagues fall and the protecting power of the Lord is being withdrawn, the kinds of things, the kinds of turmoil and Satan uh, and, and chaos that Satan is going to put this world through when the restraining power of the four angels which are holding back the winds of strife and Satan is loosed for a little while, the kinds of chaos and mayhem that this world is going to go through, but again, and we'll talk about this a little more in the next uh, in our next presentation, God's people will be delivered. That's the thing that, that settles my heart and gives me courage and understanding that God is going to take care of his own. God will not lose any of those who are sealed unto salvation. But a war is being fought for your souls, brothers and sisters. Don't miss that point. As important as it is, Satan would like to have you, would like to destroy you, but God has promised to protect you and give you victory and deliver you in these last days. I turn now to Titus chapter 2 and verse 12. And I'm going to ask you to turn to that uh, text with me, if you will. The book is Titus chapter 2 and verse 12. Titus 2, 12. Give you a moment to find it. Titus chapter 2, just a tiny book tucked there. It only has three chapters. Uh, Philemon and then follows Hebrews. So if you go to Hebrews and work your way back just a little bit. Philemon, a very short book. And Titus, just a tad longer. I'm in Titus chapter 2 and verse 12. The Bible says, Titus 2, 12. In fact, I'm going to uh, go against myself here and go back to verse 11. And uh, then we can pick it up on the screen at verse 12. Uh, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. That text is a sermon in itself. Here's Titus 2.12. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. So the grace of God that has appeared to all men teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly. Uh, the, the New Testament word for soberly uh, is a word that lets us know that we need to uh, live with an awareness of the times. The Bible says don't get caught up so caught up in this world that uh, so overcharged with the drunkenness and the wildness of this world that you forget the times in which we find ourselves. Over and over again, we find this. The Bible says, Romans uh, chapter 12, be not conformed to this world. You know, we, we, are, we are told, um, and I think I want to just turn to that because it's a good text. And um, uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Um, I didn't have it in my list of, of texts, um, but I want to just, just, just add this. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, uh, which is your reasonable service. And verse 2, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed, the Bible says, by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what uh, is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Again, you see this over and over again in the New Testament. Don't be conformed to this world. Don't be molded to this world. Don't be uh, compacted by this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Here uh, in Paul's letter to Titus, we, we see a similar exhortation. Live soberly, live righteously, live godly in this present age. Now, why is that important? Why should we do that? Because the hour of his judgment is come. It is, it is too late to trifle. 
it is too late to mollycoddle sin. It is too late to indulge in sin. It is too late to wallow in sin. It's time to get the victory over sin, to overcome sin, and to be keenly aware of the times in which we live. Our very first text, the scripture lesson for this particular sermon, Romans chapter 13. And do this, knowing the time, being aware of the time. You see, there's a lot of people who don't know the time, who are not aware of the time, who don't understand the time. Their minds are too caught up in the things of this world. But we as Christians ought to be keenly aware of the time. I like the Darby translation of Titus chapter 2, verse 12. The Bible says uh, in the Darby translation to live soberly, justly, piously in this present course of things. The thought is the same. The burden is the same. We've got to be aware. We've got to have our feet planted firmly on the ground and our head and our heart in lockstep with Jesus as we address the times in which we find ourselves. God is doing so much for us, to us, with us, through us, and we must serve him faithfully in these last days. So Satan now is angry with the church. He always has been. But he has reserved a particular animus, a particular venom, for the church in these last days, the church that exists just prior to the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The church is the object of Satan's rage. He wants to destroy the remnant, the last remaining portion of the people of God. And I want to nuance uh, that word remnant for just a little bit because remnants has always been there, have, there has always been a remnant. There is now a remnant. There will always be a remnant. From the days of old until this day, God has always had a faithful people that could be termed the remnant. Faithful men and women who are loyal soldiers in the army of God have always existed. We, we have a view of them in Hebrews chapter 11. We don't have time to read that very, very beautiful chapter, but it is worth study and contemplation. God has never been without a faithful witness. So this remnant is the final remnant. Satan is wroth with the remnant of the church's seed. He's angry with that last portion. That's the portion that exists just prior to the second coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He has special venom for uh, the remnant. Uh, remnant is not just the last portion of something. Uh, remnant is a very wonderful term. It, it, it means that portion that exists after trauma. Um, what is judged as faithful after there has been a rending or trauma or drama or conflict, uh, a rending, a forced separation. The original has been tried and tested and a declaration has been made that that which is left is true to the original and it is called remnant. Now let me stress this point because it's very important. You cannot have remnant without judgment. Somebody, some court, some tribunal, some judiciary has looked at the evidence before and after trauma and made a determination that what is left, what remains, what endures, that part is identical to the original part and is called remnant. So the remnant is not just what remains, remnant is what has remained after trial and drama. So the remnant has gone through something and has remained faithful to the original and as such is called remnant. Revelation chapter 14 we want to 
turn to that quickly. Revelation 14 and verse 12. Revelation 14 and 12. And I'm turning quickly to Revelation 14 and verse 12. And I've got my new Bible, and my pages are, there we go, Revelation 14 and verse 12. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Um, remnant is that group or that portion that has endured and persevered. Um, here is the patience of the saints, says the New King James. There are many translations that translate this. Here is the endurance or the perseverance of the saints. So remnant, understand me, is a consequence of conflict. When we look at Isaiah chapter 10, verses 20 through 34, it's a long passage and we don't have time to read it now. The theme of remnant after judgment uh, is very, very clear. You cannot have remnant without judgment. You cannot have remnant without trauma. You cannot have remnant unless a judgment has been, a verdict has been rendered, a judgment has been set, and it has been determined that that which is left is equal to that which was there at the beginning. So remnant is that part that's not only left over, but that has endured the trial and the drama and the separation and the rending. So remnant then is defined by crisis. The remnant is that part that remains after a crisis has taken place. In Isaiah chapter 10, um, we see a number of things. Um, in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 3, um, Isaiah has two sons. One is called Shir uh, Jashub, which means a remnant shall return. So God was, was, was telling uh, Israel that even after the trauma and drama of Assyrian captivity, that there is going to be a remnant. But Again, you've got the drama, the trauma of Assyrian captivity. The other son was Mahal Shalahazbaz, which is a mouthful, meaning a remnant shall return. Isaiah prophesied in the days of crisis in Israel. There were two major crises. The first national crisis came when Judah was threatened by an alliance between Israel and Syria in about 734 BC. The key issues were God's sovereignty, <coughs> sovereignty rather, and his power to deliver and save. In other words, those very things that make you the remnant. The second crisis, which came about in 701 during the siege of Jerusalem, when people were literally eating their own children and even unclean animals and unclean foods were being sold for large sums of money. So desperate were the times during this siege. The prophetic call was the same in both instances. Are we going to trust God or rely on man? In this instance, the politics of man. And in both instances, both times of crisis, God assured his faithful that after the trauma, after the drama, after the war, after the rending, after the separation, a remnant would return to him. So you understand my point. That remnant is a consequence of drama and trauma. The remnant is not just that which is left over, the remnant is that part which withstands the trauma, which withstands the drama, which remains standing and faithful in the face of opposition and loss. 
So the remnant is the part that has been judged by God to be faithful even in times of faithlessness and has been judged by God to be faithful to the original after a rending or a separation has taken place. So Isaiah covers the time from the first crisis through the second crisis and reaches down to the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So those prophecies of faithfulness, of an abiding presence with God, even through wicked and tough times, can be applied to our times. So we are not just a remnant, we are the remnant. We are those who will be faithful to God through times of trouble, through times of drama, through times of trauma, through times of separation, through times of wickedness, through times of apathy, through times of Laodiceanism, God is going to have a faithful people who will stand with him, stand by him, stand for him, who will allow him to work with them, for them, uh, through them, to do a great work for him. They will be accounted the remnant and God will deliver them because he has promised to do so and because God is faithful to his word. So we see in Isaiah a love that will not let go and a love that will keep God and his people unto the second coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, we see in Isaiah this desperate determination of God, this view of God that is tenacious and will not let us go and will hold on to us until Jesus comes again. Um, as we approach the judgment of this world. I want to go, uh, before my time gets away, to 2 Peter chapter 3, verses uh, 8 through 10. You're in your New Testament. We want to go to 2 Peter, James and Peter, or rather Peter, and uh, then we go to 2 Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3. And we consider verses 8 through 10. Second Peter 3, and we pick it up at verse 8. The word of God says, But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. <clears throat> that gives us background for what he says in verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And I'll read verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt, melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. The key is tucked right there in the middle of those verses. <clears throat> Excuse me, in verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Whether it be a day or a thousand years, the promises are true that God will have a remnant. Uh, he is long-suffering toward us, and he is not willing that any should perish for which we can praise and thank God. So when the question is asked, as it is so often, where is God? The answer is right where you left him. He is right there waiting for you, loving you, and uh, working in your behalf. Luke chapter 19, verse 13, is important uh, as respects this idea of working for the Lord. Luke 19, 13. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John 17, 18, and 19. Uh, I like this particular text uh, because of the, the, the Greek language that is, is used. Luke chapter 19 and verse 
13. Luke 19 and 11, 12 and 13. Here we go. So he called his 10 servants, delivered unto them 10 minas or minas, uh, and said, do business till I come. Now, I want to start there. That's verse 13. This is the same parable that takes place in Matthew chapter 25. In Matthew 25, it's called the parable of the talents. Uh, Luke uh, calls it the parable of the minas. A mina is about 100 days wages. So it's a considerable amount of money. These men are given... Uh, a mina, they're given a fairly substantial amount of money. And then the Lord comes back sometime later and asks them, what would you do with the money that I gave you? What is important here is that um, the Lord says, do business in the King James, it's occupy till I come. So, this idea of occupying, of doing business, is what God wants us to do in these last days while he is away, preparing to return. He's saying, do business. This word, occupy, means transact business. It means don't sit around idle. Don't just look at the world. Don't just observe what's going on be part of what's going on, occupy until I come. Busy yourself with the work of the Lord until I come because I am coming quickly and I want you to be with me. Keep on working until I see you face to face to face. Now quickly, I want to go to this last text, John chapter 9, 4, book of, of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John chapter 9, and verse 4, John 9, 4. I want to read it very quickly before my time gets away. John 9 and verse 4. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no man can work. Christ is saying, soon work time will be over. So we must work the works of God while we can because there is coming a time when we will not be able to. Again, we go back to our key text, Romans 13, and that knowing the time, that now it is high time to cast off the works of darkness and to take on the works of light. The hour is far spent, the day is at hand, and we must be about our Father's business. God bless you.